this talk is going to delve into the tunnel shafts that we installed uh, for the Ohio River Tunnel in Louisville, Kentucky. This, these were performed a few years ago. Schnabel's part of the project uh, was fairly simple um, and straightforward. We were installing three circular secant pile shafts. These were meant to be uh, access for the tunnel, for the tunnel boring machine to get lower down into the hole, for the muck from the tunnel to get uh, extracted out, and for the TBM to be extracted at the end of the tunnel. Um, so that in itself is pretty straightforward. Um, but what's unique about this is that the earth retention system that we used, the circular C compiles, um, you know, it's a 3D problem. It's not a two-dimensional wall that was built, which is typical of uh, soldier beams and lagging or tiebacks. The circular secant pile shaft um, does not have any internal bracing, does not have any external uh, tiebacks or support. Um, it's one material. The only thing we used is concrete. It was unreinforced. So in effect, it was just a series of overlapping drilled shafts that were filled with concrete. Um, we did that to resist the high earth pressures, the water pressures, and to give a, a clear unobstructed access for the tunnel boring machine. Um, so this talk will we'll delve into that a bit. Okay, the CSO concept in general, this is what the tunnel was for. It was not a transportation tunnel. Uh, the CSO stands for combined sewer overflow. And what that means is that you have two different sewer systems that are combined, mainly for efficiency. Um, the sewer system that is for uh, sewage comes from buildings, from uh, your houses, um, anything that drains from your house, you know, sink, bathtub, uh, toilet, they all drain to a pipe and eventually make their way to a treatment plant. Um, some cities, uh, combine those with the runoff from streets during rain events. And so any um, water from rain or storms uh, eventually um, you know, combine into the same sewer, which goes to the treatment plant. And under normal circumstances, on the left is what that looks like. Everything combined uh, running to the treatment plant. But during uh, heavy rainfalls, during severe thunderstorms, like what's happening right now in Chicago, uh, they can overfill and exceed capacity. Um, and so that they don't back up into buildings or onto the streets. A lot of cities, what they did when they were constructed 50, 100 years ago, they had an overflow uh, outlet pipe that went into you know, a body of water, a river, a lake, um, Some place that was away from people, and at the time when it was designed was perfectly acceptable, um, but now not so much. And so a lot of major cities, uh, major metro areas around the country are going to um, deep rock tunnel systems, which uh, store the excess or overflow wastewater until it can be safely pumped after the storm event. So this is, in reality, what some of the overflow looks like. Uh, some pipes that are uh, depositing directly into rivers or lakes, um, some pollution in lakes themselves, uh, backing up into manholes and streets. And just a few weeks ago, when I was putting this presentation together, I came across something online, a news article about um, you know, 84 million gallons of rainwater and raw sewage backing up into the Merrimack River in Massachusetts. And I saw that and my first thought was, that's disgusting, um, that's nasty. And then I got excited because I thought I can use this in my presentation. So I quickly uh, snapped a shot of that and put it in a slide here. So these are things that we're still dealing with right now. Um, a lot of major cities have already solved the problem with deep rock tunnels that have been going on around the country. A lot of them still have uh, mandates from the federal government to do something about it. So this doesn't continue to happen. Uh, it's a huge environmental uh, concern as well as just sanitation, uh, sanitary concern in general. So 
as I was saying, there, there are a lot of CSOs around the country. The majority of them are in the Midwest and the Northeast, um, Boston, DC, um, all the cities around the Great Lakes, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Cleveland, um, and then some in the Pacific Northwest as well, Seattle, uh, Portland, a lot of these cities have combined sewer overflow systems, which uh, are in the process of getting changed. Like I mentioned, the federal EPA uh, has mandated you know, certain timelines for cities to uh, fix their problem so that they don't have pollution or sanitation issues. In Louisville, uh, here's a, a snapshot of that. This is south of the Ohio River in Kentucky. Indiana is to the north. The uh, green and blue dots are different overflow systems. Uh, the green are just sanitary. Uh, the blue are combined with the um, um, runoff from rain events as well from the street. The, the pink shaded area is kind of like a watershed of what that entails. So. It's a pretty decent size area, and it is fairly common for this to overflow in Louisville. Um, they were they had a mandate from the federal government to fix that. They chose a deep rock tunnel system, and that's this project that, that we're talking about. So the overall plan, this is a view of downtown Louisville, uh, the major gridded streets that are here. The tunnel system itself is right along the riverfront, although a few hundred feet below the ground surface. Um, there are two access shafts on the left side, uh, one exit shaft, the drop shaft, retrieval shaft on the right, um, and then the outline of the tunnel, uh, as you can see, goes right along the riverfront. So this was the plan that Louisville came up with uh, to solve their overflow issues and all the combined sanitary and sewer uh, pipes are tied into this. See? So in Google Maps, a snapshot of this, the red circles are the access shafts and retrieval shafts that we installed. Um, on, on the left there, there's two of them that are together. That was where the tunnel started. Uh, this is where we started our work as well and took only about a week after we started working here to realize that we were on the wrong side of the flood wall. There's a flood wall that's oh, maybe 15 foot high that goes along the, the Ohio River just in case of flood events. And we were on the north side of that. Uh, all the buildings are on the south side of that. So after the first major rain event, we realized this was this could be a problem. Um, it ended up that we never did have a flood that shut down our work but it got very close and we started seeing water uh, rise up out of the river a few occasions. On the right hand side is the retrieval shaft. And this was nestled in a very, very congested spot on the east side of town. Um, the access shafts on the left side, on the left picture, they're in a really nice big open field. Uh, this was undeveloped uh, property in downtown Louisville, nice big open area for construction. This retrieval, retrieval shaft, we barely had enough room for our equipment and to move around. I believe our forklift performed a lot of uh, seven point turns on this. And you know, we started off the access shafts in the winter time. By the time we got to the summer, we were in the, working on the retrieval shaft. And in the very hot days of, of summer in Louisville, we realized we were right across the street from a large um, butchery slaughterhouse and we could we could tell we were there by the smell. So always something interesting. Here's the tunnel profile uh, from a plan sheet of the drawings. It shows that the tunnel itself is a little over 200 feet below the ground surface. The uh, shafts that are shown above the, uh, the cutoff line here are the secant pile that go and embed into rock. Uh, the tunnel itself extends another you know, 100 to 150 foot into rock uh, to get into a certain layer. And then it was tunneled uh, to the retrieval shaft. So this is a typical profile of the depth. 
And this is what it looks like for the uh, soil profile itself for soil and rock. Uh, the brown shade is the overburden for different types of soil, which varied from silty clay to sand and gravel. Um, basically a, a good mixture of Midwest soil, anything you could think of we had there, including fill material. And the, the yellow and the purple veins here are different types of rock. In the Midwest, it's mainly sedimentary. We had uh, different types of shale, uh, limestone, and dolomite uh, for this project. And the tunnel was decided to get below some weaker layers of rock and into a more intact, uh, for the most part, a dolomite at the bottom. So the two shafts on the left were very shallow. They were um, about 60 foot deep. Slide's not going here. Okay, so the seek and, sap, seek and pile shaft profiles. The left side here are the two access shafts. They were approximately 60 foot deep and 45, 46 foot in diameter. Uh, the retrieval shaft was a bit different. That was closer to 110 foot deep, uh, but only about 31 foot in diameter. I showed the, the soil profile here on the borings. Again, a very uh, mixture of soil, some low blow count silty clays, some higher blow count uh, sands and gravels, and two different layers, two to three different layers of rock that we tapped into. Again, the, the goal was to get about five foot into this very bottom uh, limestone or dolomite layer that was very intact, uh, very few fractures. So different from a typical project where we just go five foot into rock, we actually went five foot into uh, a very specific uh, rock unit. And in some cases that meant going uh, about 20 foot into rock in total. The retrieval shaft had the majority of the rock. So let's talk about the design. Um, this is different, as I was mentioning, from a typical earth retention system design. This is very much a three-dimensional problem. <clears throat> I've got a few slides to address the design here. Um, very basically, we're looking at the design of a cylinder uh, in three dimensions. The series of overlapping secant piles make a cylinder that can be excavated out. You have earth pressure and hydrostatic pressure acting on all sides uh, of this uh, shaft for your loads. That's the driving force. Um, looking at it in two dimensions, uh, just cutting a section here, we have, um, you know, laterally or lateral earth pressure and hydrostatic water pressure that increase linearly with depth. Uh, due to the fact that the secant piles are a very stiff and rigid element, um, when acting as one and strictly in compression, uh, we designed this for K0 as opposed to the active pressure, which isn't really allowed to develop due to lack of deflection and movement. Uh, so that's something that's different than, than a typical earth retention system. Uh, the water table, due to the fact that this was near the river, was going to be open for a few years, uh, was designed to be at existing grade. So again, higher than usual. Um, the different... Um, you know, constraints that we took into account that go into, into the design, uh, which I'll touch on in a few more slides here, are the tolerance of the piles. Um, based on our uh, historical data, we've shown that we can achieve 0.5% verticality for the secant piles. Um, again, I'll explain that in a few slides here, um, but the, the piles themselves, 0.5%, the overall cylinder, which is the design of the complete system, we designed for an out of round tolerance of 0.25%. And, um, and what I find really fascinating about this, this type of design, uh, as well as this type of construction, is um, you know, what's shown here, we have increasing pressure with depth, um, but the wall itself, uh, that we're making with overlapping secant piles, that actually gets thinner with depth. So we have the lowest load at the top and we have the highest load at the bottom. And due to the construction procedures, we start off with what's theoretically the thickest uh, part of the wall. And by the time we get to the bottom, 
uh, due to the fact that uh, the piles can deviate a certain amount, we have potentially the thinnest section of wall. So that's a design challenge that we take into account. And although it seems kind of backwards, uh, that's how these are built. And you know, that makes things uh, interesting and challenging. So let's talk about that. How do we account for the thickness of the wall? Uh, there's a term that's used called effective thickness. Uh, and that's shown here on the left, uh, T1, the initial thickness at the top of the pile. Uh, all secant piles are designed with a certain center to center spacing to start off, uh, which equates to an effective thickness that we call it, which is uh, the overlap of two piles that are adjacent to each other. And let's see if I can go back here. Okay. So at the top of the cylinder that's being designed, we have a certain thickness based on uh, the effective thickness. The pressures that we're designing for are taken out by a cylinder that we're only counting on the effective thickness for. Uh, the scallops that are outside that uh, don't really come into play. That's more just a, a means and methods of installation. Now, when the piles are drilled, um, they're not 100% plumb. Uh, there is some tolerance that, that's allowed, and we design for that. You take that into account. And the worst case scenario would be if two adjacent piles deviate in exact opposite directions from each other. In doing so, you get a resultant effective thickness that is much smaller than what started off at. What we take into account in the design is a verticality, which I mentioned is 0.5%. And we calculate what the theoretical effective thickness could be at the bottom if we actually deviate that much. And that's what's, uh, that's what's designed for. So here's a, a series of three piles, uh, very typical for secant piles are installed in a primary and secondary manner, <clears throat> meaning that every other pile is installed for a certain sequence, uh, pile one, three, five, seven, and so forth. And then we fall back and we install the secondary piles such as two, four, six, and eight uh, to fall in between. And we carve out uh, part of the primary piles during the installation of the secondary pile. What we've seen is that uh, the secondary piles, because they're constrained on either side by the primary piles, hardly ever deviate into the primary piles themselves, like what's shown here. They usually don't deviate directly away. In reality, what happens is they deviate to the path of least resistance, which is to the soil. And that can be either uh, to the outside or the inside of the cylinder or the the access shaft itself. So this example shows uh, the deviation more perpendicular to the wall as opposed to uh, deviating into one of the, the primary C compiles. The C compiles themselves are typically three, four, or 5,000 PSI uh, strength in concrete. So, um, you know, typically when you're drilling, it's not going to veer towards that, it's going to veer away. And if we can install the primary piles very plumb to begin with, we found that we get very little deviation on the secondary piles. So another, uh, to oversimplify things here, you know, here's a, a horizontal cross section showing basically what's a uh, tunnel design, you know, hoop stresses. The cylinder that we're designing for an access shaft is basically a vertical tunnel. And we have earth pressure and water pressure on one side uh, that's resisted by the thrust running through uh, the cylinder on you know, the other side, the resultants here. So equal and opposite loads, ideally. But again, in reality, uh, things are different. Things are not symmetric. Uh, things are not loaded evenly. And we have crane surcharges. We have conveyor uh, belt footings. Um, that have huge surcharges, and they induce stresses that make it unsymmetric on the, sh uh, the overall shaft. That gets a lot more complicated to design for in a two-dimensional um, you know, back-of-the-envelope calculation, 
So we typically use finite element analysis uh, to analyze the stresses in the concrete for that. And one other thing I like about this is it produces nice, uh, nice colors, nice uh, visuals to submit. So with that being the design, how do we actually construct these? You know, these were, um, we had a, a few different design conditions for uh, this Louisville project. Uh, the two access shafts were very similar, and then we had one that was deeper. Uh, so greater pressures, but smaller diameter. You know, how do we achieve these things that we're designing for? As an industry, deep foundations, we're constantly building things that we cannot see. And so it's an ongoing challenge uh, to try and quantify and measure what we're installing. Um, what we end up doing for C compiles is measuring verticality, uh, measuring the concrete, uh, both volume and strength that we put into it. And we observe the behavior of how we're installing these. Uh, what that does is, uh, as far as drilling or observing the behavior, the drill spoils that come out, we can verify our assumptions during the design for the loads that are exerted on the wall. And we can look at the drill rigs, their torque, their behavior, uh, to see if we're encountering something that's different. Again, this is all things that we cannot visually see. Um, all you guys know that this is the industry we're in. And that's, that's what I think makes things exciting. You know, we're constantly trying to find indirect ways to um, measure what we're doing, both as engineers and contractors. So the verticality monitoring itself, we have a system that has real-time data for our drill rig operator to view while he's drilling. And it shows a, or we have a separate display in the cab of the drill rig. Once we finish drilling a shaft, we can send down a device that gives um, a readout of the actual deviation. So our driller knows uh, right away, do we need to re-drill this? Are we straight? Are we good? We don't need to wait and do uh, some non-destructive testing or do some other indirect ways of measuring. Uh, before we fill our secant pile with concrete, we make sure it's straight and vertical. Uh, the concrete itself, that's very common. Uh, nothing exciting here. Um, you know, we're making sure that we achieve a certain strength, you know, the 28 day strength that's designed for. However, the one interesting thing about this is that because of the sequence in which we install this and the fact that we need to drill through uh, some of the existing piles or the piles that we install, um, we don't want to wait too long to drill our secondary piles. We want to drill those um, hopefully within a few days after the primaries are installed. What this graph shows here is that within just a few days, we're seeing three, four to 5,000 PSI of strength. If we don't have to, we don't wanna be drilling through that strong of concrete. We wanna try and turn that around and um, drill through as weak a concrete as possible. Uh, obviously after it's set up though, so it's not damaged or cracked. Um, so we're in a constant um, struggle to balance uh, our production rates versus the strength of the primary piles and when we fall back to install the secondaries. This makes uh, the drilling much easier. So cores of the rock itself. What we like to do as a, as a practice is to try and retrieve intact core samples when we're drilling, uh, when we sock it into rock for those projects where we do that, to verify the actual rock that we're um, you know, embedding our, our seek and pile shaft into. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. One is um, to look for fractures, uh, especially on these tunnel projects that extend below the bottom of uh, our seek and piles. We want to know, as does the, the tunnel contractor, is the rock highly fractured? Is there going to be water seepage? Do they need to develop a grouting program? Um, so these are things we can tell from that. We also take cores of the cores, you know, small three inch samples of the larger cores so that we can verify the strength of rock that we're in uh, to, again, to verify our assumptions in the design. 
concrete volume. Uh, yet again, an indirect way that we measure uh, what we're installing. Um, if we measure the concrete going into a shaft and we see that, or a sequent pile, and see that we have less than the neat theoretical volume, we know we don't have a full diameter of that pile, and that's been compromised. Um, that's the reason why, uh, as you can see on the left here, we use casing. Uh, for all of our sequent pile projects, we use casing full depth so that we know we have the full diameter of the pile and we have a head of concrete on top of that casing as we're extracting it um, so that there's no chance of uh, soil or inclusions to occur in our sequent piles uh, unless there are some extenuating circumstances. Um, likewise, if we, after we pull the casing, if we see that there are we have a take of maybe 150% of the neat theoretical volume. Uh, we know that there is a, a pocket uh, potentially of soft soil where our uh, concrete, which is still fluid when we pull the casing, actually exerts pressure onto the ground laterally and pushes into it. And we may expect there to be uh, bulges in the secant pile wall ourselves that need to be addressed later. So again, some indirect ways of measuring what's going on in the ground. The template itself, this is what locks us in at the ground surface to begin with uh, for drilling 100 foot deep and keeping a 0.5% verticality. We're only allowed a few inches, I think up to six inches of deviation. So we wanna make sure we're locked in at the start. We use a few foot thick template of concrete that maintains our casing in one place. Uh, it's very tight um, so that we don't have rattling around or deviation to begin with. So all the, all the talk of drilling into hard rock and drilling 100 foot deep, in order to do that, we need heavy duty equipment here. Uh, we need large drill rigs, we need um, you know, thick double walled casing, we need large support equipment, everything uh, weighs a lot. The drill rigs are over a quarter million pounds. Um, the casing that we use is typically around four foot in diameter, shown here in the center. Um, this stuff allows us to go 20 foot into rock. Uh, it allows us to get through obstructions and boulders, and it ensures that we have uh, the full diameter of the pile by taking the casing full depth. So this is what's required to meet our, our tight design tolerances. Uh, a few pictures here of retrieving rock cores. Again, some of the, the different tooling that we have here uh, so that we can check for fractures in the rock, the strength of the rock. Uh, we use core barrels with teeth, uh, roller cone core barrels, uh, buckets if we're drilling underwater, a lot of different um, techniques that can be used that previously were unavailable. I'd say just a few decades ago, uh, we had to use down the hole hammers or even breakers uh, to go down and get through certain uh, obstructions or into certain density rock. Uh, the equipment that's available now is amazing at how strong it is and how expensive uh, to get through some of these things. So our superintendent on this job wanted me to make sure to show a picture that we were working in Louisville in zero degree weather in the winter when we started and there was snow, which is pretty rare for Kentucky, as well as uh, 100 degree weather in the summer uh, when we were right next to that slaughterhouse um, and we could smell it like it was right next door. Um, you know, the weather is uh, something we all need to deal with and working in the Midwest, right in the middle of um, where we have both or all seasons, um, it has a big impact. So one, one last note here, I just have a few more slides. The finished face of the sequent piles. I was making a few comments earlier about, um, you know, bulges in, in the face. On the right hand side, you can see some bulges that are sticking out actually one to two feet from the sequin pile itself. That was a soft zone of soil where while the concrete was still fluid, it pushed into it when the casing was extracted. 
These were things that the um, tunnel contractor or excavator needed to deal with and break off as they uh, proceeded down with the excavation after the fact. Um, likewise, right next to it, it actually appears that there is um, an indentation into the secant piles. Uh, did not go back beyond where we measure the effective thickness. It was just in the scalloped part, so that does not affect our design. Uh, but still things that need to be taken into account and definitely observed after the fact. Um, but it's also interesting to see, uh, you know, the teeth marks or the rotation of how the casing was extracted in the concrete here. You can also tell the different soil layers that we encountered by the different shading of whether we were in sand or clay or rocks or cobbles. Um, that's kind of neat to see. So that was, uh, that was my presentation here. I thank you for your attention. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them here. Uh, I can also take emails, and since I'm not in person, you can also seek out someone else from Schnabel. Um, a few of us are there to talk to as well. Um, I hope to see everyone in person again here soon, and I uh, thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Stan. We actually do have a few questions, so maybe we can get uh, one or two of them answered if that's okay. Okay. Um, the first one says, great job, Stan. It seems that the basic concept depends heavily on the install geometry creating a cylinder. What options, if any, do you have to address out of tolerance, out of tolerance installation? Okay. So, yeah, we, we assign a certain tolerance uh, when we design the project. And let's say we install some piles and one of them varies outside of that tolerance. Uh, there are a few things we can do. One is we recognize that before we pour the concrete. Um, so one option is to just fill that with lean mix, going back in the next day and re-drill it to a tighter tolerance. Uh, the second thing we can do is um, look at the adjacent piles. And typically what is designed for is two adjacent piles that both deviate in opposite directions a certain amount. But if you have one pile that doesn't deviate or deviates a lower amount, it is possible that an adjacent pile that deviates greater can still be okay when looked at the big picture and looking at your effective thickness. So a few different things you can do, and there are more um, for different situations, but those are the two most common. Very good. Um, the, the next question asks about the rock a little bit and with the secant piles. I believe your diagram showed that the, the secant piles were actually keying into rock, but how much embedment was that? And then after construction, how much, if any, water infiltration is typical between secants or at the secant rock interface at the bottom of the excavation? Okay, a few different questions there. I'll do my best here. Um, for this particular project, uh, we were going five foot into a certain layer of limestone. Um, depending on the location of the access shaft or retrieval shaft, in order to get to that five foot of limestone, <clears throat> excuse me, in some cases we needed to go um, an additional five, 10, or even 15 foot through uh, a shale layer or a highly fractured dolomite above. Um, so I think we drilled up to maybe 20 some foot into rock for this project. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> What's very typical is to go three to five foot into an intact rock. And uh, there was a grouting program that was designed. Uh, what we pulled out and retrieved showed very intact rock with very thin uh, fractures. So they were able to adjust their grouting program accordingly based on what we encountered. And it really depends on the type of rock or what's at the bottom of a secant pile as to the water, potential water inflow uh, into that, you know, below the, the bottom of the secant piles. Very good. And I'll read this other last question too. It ties in with your, um, your rock embedment as well. Um, how fast were you actually advancing through that 20 feet of rock? Uh, very slow. Um, you know, we typically measure rock penetration rate on the order of uh, feet per hour. And, you know, the rock strength, let me see if I can go back here real quick. Um, here we go. 
So the rock strength we had on this job varied from you know 11 to 21 ksi. Uh, that 21 ksi that's that's pretty high strength rock. We were only going a few feet per hour through that. Um, you know we're again it depends on the fractured uh, the intactness of the rock depends on the strength uh, how abrasive it is uh, you know the kind of rock but for 21 ksi rock we were only going a few feet per hour gotcha and actually actually there's one more question here that um, maybe will make a little bit more sense talking about that rock advancement how many rigs drill rigs did you have going at a time on this uh, we had a maximum of two rigs. Uh, when we were at the access shafts, where we had two shafts next to each other, we had two rigs going at the same time. Uh, the retrieval shaft, we only had enough room for one rig, uh, so that's all we used there. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you.